Good morning, everyone, and happy Thursday. I think our lesson this morning, okay, I have to say this, that our group, when we would meet, um, we would finish about 10, 12, 10, 15, as the year has progressed, we made it in at 1030. So I think as the year gets to an end, we've become closer, our groups have become closer, and it's harder to wrap it up as soon as we want to and be here on time. So we just... Uh, Thank you for the spiritual growth that we've had through this year. Um, just a reminder, uh, phones off um, for all you folks who like to hear your phones. And uh, also this morning, I think our lesson was so much about God's control. He is truly in control. We are not in control. And I think we learned that a lot. And we learned that from this lesson. And we're going to learn that in our God moment this morning. And our God moment is by Joni. Anderson, Andrews, Anderson was her maiden name, and now Andrews, <laughs> sorry, I got Anderson on my mind, anyway, Father God, we just thank you for Joni Andrews, and her beautiful sharing this moment of a story that certainly tells us all that God is so much in control, and we just thank you for her faith that she always turned to you, Lord, and may we all remember that in our days. In your mighty name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you, Joni Andrews. Hello. Ooh. <laughs> okay, that's loud. <laughs> All right, well, let's just say a quick prayer. Um, oh, God, wow, you are so in control, and I just stand so humbled to be here, and, um, and Lord, I just thank you for the way you have taken the twists and turns of my life and, um, and just made it glorious. And Father, I do thank you for my mother and for the faith she instilled in me and um, just the blessing that it was to be her daughter. In Jesus' precious name, amen. That just made me want to cry. <laughs> so, <laughs> let me not cry. So, when I was a young girl, my mom gave me a beautiful plaque with a poem written on it, which today, I, I, to this day, I can quote from heart, but I'm not going to do it right now, so I'll read it. Um, As children bring their broken toys with tears for us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. But then instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help with ways that were my own. At last, I snatched them back and cried, how could you be so slow? My child, he said, what could I do? You never did let go. What a powerful lesson a mother could teach her young daughter. Let go, trust God, he's got this. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. During the health section of my sixth grade science class, our teacher decided to give us hands-on experience on what it would be like to give someone an injection. So, she bravely passed out syringes to each of us, along with a cup of water and an orange. She taught us how to draw up the water and inject it into the orange, and well, from that moment on, I knew I wanted to be a doctor. My love of science at that early age, combined with my love of helping people, made this seem to be the obvious choice of profession to 11-year-old me. So, armed with that desire, I literally spent the next 10 years doing everything in my power to make that dream a reality. Along with the endless studying for all those science classes that I took in high school and college, I prepared myself with hours of volunteering in hospitals, emergency rooms, labs, and doctor's offices. I was committing to, committed to making myself the best medical student possible. However, one thing stood in the way of culminating my, at that point in time, life's work. I had to get accepted to medical school. <laughs> So the summer before my senior year in college was spent completing applications and writing essays. I applied to 11 schools in total, and as I took, placed each of those applications in the mailbox, I would pray for God's will to be done and silently hoped that his will and my will were in agreement. For those past 10 years, I had worked for this, prayed for this, and knew in my heart it was what I was meant to do. I saw no other future for me except being a doctor. I was invited to interview at several schools, and then I began the unbearable period of waiting for decisions, which eventually be began to roll in. Thank you so much for applying. You're a strong candidate, but <laughs> 11 out of 11 letters arrived with some variation of that wording, but. 
I was devastated. I was panicked. I was a strong student with good grades and tons of volunteer work, and yet no one wanted me. I had no idea what I was going to do. There was nothing else for me. Why had God chosen not to open the door to my life's greatest desire? I couldn't even begin to understand. But the faith my mother instilled with me, within me and the good Lord grew in me told me to trust him. I was, however, faced with the immediate problem of what was I to do. I was graduating from college in a few short weeks, and I didn't have a plan. I had always had a plan. <laughs> One day, shortly after the round of rejections arrived, I received a call from the admissions office at Georgetown University School of Medicine. I had interviewed there, and the admissions director and I had hit it off quite well. She knew from my application that I was a Christian, as was she, and she should, she, this is a tough sentence to say, she suggested I apply to the specials master program at Georgetown. It was a one-year pro program leading to a master's degree in physiology, during which I would take several classes with the current first-year medical students. She felt this would be very helpful for me so that medical schools could see my performance compared against other medical students. So I applied to the program and was accepted and headed off to Washington, D.C. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I completed my master's degree in August the following year and was once again waiting to hear if I had been accepted into medical school. This time I only applied to seven. God was so gracious and I was accepted not only into my home state school of the University of Colorado, but also into Georgetown. I was ecstatic. I had actually a choice as to where I could go and I chose to remain at Georgetown. During my master's program, I had learned the importance of being in a school which believed in God and practiced medicine accordingly. However, my parents were a bit concerned as tuition at Georgetown was triple that I would pay at CU. And I told them not to worry that I would take out student loans and everything would be just fine. <laughs> and take out loans I did. By the end of my first year, I was $48,000 in debt, which in today's dollars, it gets better, $123,000 for one year of school. I wanted to be a pediatrician, and I knew in that specialty I would never make enough money to pay off the debt I was accruing. So at the end of my first year, I applied for the Army and Navy Health Profession Scholarships. God once again was so generous, and I was awarded both. And I chose to accept the Navy because I could live by the ocean, never even considering I could be living on the ocean. <laughs> so, hmm. <laughs> So the four years of medical school were a whirlwind, and in the fall of my fourth year, I began the process of applying to pediatric residency programs. I was desperately wanting to be selected into a Navy residency program because I would be able to complete it before being required to be called up to fulfill my service obligation. If I didn't get into a Navy program and attended a civilian one, I would be called up after my first year of residency to serve my commitment as a general medical officer, not a pediatrician. So, once again, I was applying, and once again, I felt my application was incredibly strong, and once again, I was standing at a mailbox praying, and once again, God had a different plan. And once again, I was absolutely devastated. I was not selected for any Navy residency programs. I was so convinced I was one of the strongest candidates out there that I didn't even apply for civilian programs. Heartbroken me knew that God was in control, and he had it. But once again, I had to lay my broken dreams at his feet and wait. The window for applying for civilian programs was nearly closed, so I began doing that immediately. And on January 31st of my senior year in medical school, on the very last day of interviews, I flew from Washington, D.C. to Houston, Texas to interview at Texas Children's Hospital. Two months later, I matched at the unbelievably amazing pediatric residency program at Baylor College of Medicine. God placed me exactly where I was meant to be. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In February of my first year of residency, a large manila envelope was waiting in my uh, mailbox at the hospital. It was from the Navy. My heart was once again broken, as even before opening it, I knew it contained my orders to go on active duty as a general medical officer. Inside was a letter instructing me to contact my detailer, who's the person responsible for assigning my duty station. So I contacted him, and he offered me a choice of three post, pro, posts all of which sounded horrible. So one was on a, a, a destroyer tender based in Japan. The other was some clinic in some foreign country I'd never heard of. And um, the other was also on a ship based in San Diego, living on the ocean, huh? So I told him I would think about it and I would call him back. 
Well, I never called him back. <laughs> I like to say it was because I was so busy as a resident, but it was really I was hoping he'd forget all about me. <laughs> but of course, it's the Navy, and he did not. And a month later, he called me back. And so this time, though, he had compl a completely different list. And on that list was the medical clinic at Kings Bay, Georgia, Naval Submarine Base. And that's in St. Mary's, Georgia. Without one moment of hesitation, I accepted the assignment. It was a clinic, it was on land, and it was in the U.S. So that summer, I packed up my life and moved to Georgia. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Within one month of my arrival on the base in Georgia, the course of my life changed forever. I was working in military sick call, which is the, kind of the urgent care for the active duty, active duty servicemen and women, when I was asked to go out on a 14-hour Tiger cruise. Uh, and it's on one of the submarines. And a Tiger cruise is a short voyage where family members of the sailors are invited on board so that they can see their loved ones doing what they do during their three-month deployment under the water. <laughs> Talk about on top of the water. <laughs> I was going under it. <laughs> so anyway, when civilians are on a submarine, a real doctor has to be on board uh, in case anyone falls ill. The sailors normally have a corpsman uh, who takes care of them underway, but they're not allowed to care for civilians. So the following week, I headed down to the waterfront and climbed down the ladder onto the USS Kentucky ballistic missile submarine. I didn't have any job to do except to stand by if needed. The ship's corpsman showed me to the officer's study where I could sit and relax and enjoy the journey. I'd been settled in there for about an hour or so when a young ensign came strolling in and stopped dead in his tracks. He asked me if I was one of the wives and I told him no, I was the doctor on the cruise for the day. Well, a light went off in his brain, and it was completely visible on his face. He immediately asked me if I wanted a tour of the boat, and I said I would love it. Well, that sweet young ensign, who I did outrank, um, ended up stealing my heart, and we were engaged a year later, and this September we celebrate our 28th anniversary. <laughs> so Romans 8.28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This has been one of my favorite verses, always. For the longest time, I never really appreciated the full meaning of this verse. God causes all things to work together. When I look back over the disappointments in my pursuit of becoming a doctor and a pediatrician, I can now see exactly what God had in mind, and I can see clearly his hand in every aspect of that journey. If I had been accepted to medical school my first try, I would have remained in Colorado, but instead he placed me at Georgetown, where I learned the importance of attending a medical school founded on Christian principles. This made me accept the position offered by Georgetown and not see you. Georgetown's tuition was three times higher at CU, and my student loan debt after that first year was truly suffocating. This led me to apply for the Army and Navy scholarships. I grew up in landlocked Colorado, and I did truly desire to be by the ocean, just not on it. <laughs> this led me to accept the Navy scholarship and not the Army. If I had been accepted into a Navy pediatric residency program, I would have remained there all three years to, com to complete it. But instead, I wasn't and got called up after my first year at Texas Children's. I believe that God made those first choices for duty stations so unappealing that when the detailer called back, I would jump at the opportunity to be at a U.S. base on land. <laughs> so, um, and that assignment did lead me to a very brief 14-hour period on a nuclear submarine where he had so also placed my husband, who very much like me, ended up on that submarine by a very convoluted and God-directed path. God causes all things to work together for good, even if we can't see it in the midst. Thank you, Lord. I love you. <laughs>well, good morning and welcome to our visitors. If we've got, we've got, I know we've got a couple visitors here with us and hello to our Zoom groups. I'm Greta Zimmerman and I'm happy to be up here with you today. Um, if you're wondering why I'm sitting on a Tuesday evening, I was playing pickleball and I went for a shot and I heard a pop in the back of my calf. So um, it's all good. I'm getting better, but uh, happy to be here with you and happy to be sitting down. Well, 
Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Next week is our last discussion, lesson discussion week. It's also our second visitor day. So if you have a friend who wanted to join you today, but she couldn't, she gets another chance next week. And then the week after that is May 4th, and that is our sharing day. And it will be over in Bagby Parish Hall. And it is such a wonderful day to share what you've learned from the scriptures. And that's the day that you will be bringing canned goods and blue jeans. Uh, Debbie did such a great job last week showing us how the blue jeans turn into these adorable little shoes, much needed shoes. And um, it was really helpful to see the completed project. Well, today we will be looking at Acts chapter 20, with our focus being verses 15 through 31. And we've seen that Paul has been traveling through the Mediterranean region with a group of disciples. They have been preaching and planning churches and encouraging believers. The church is growing because others are witness to Paul's transformation. And these verses show us how Paul is a man with a mission. He's determined to fulfill the purpose that God has set out for him. I'd like to pray for us before we get started, so please bow your heads. Oh Lord, thank you so much for the way that you completely altered Paul's heart. Once he knew you, nothing could stop him from spreading the gospel everywhere he went. May we have the same urgency to share what we know about you to be true with others. We pray this in the confidence of your grace. Amen. All right. So what we have been learning in the book of Acts is God's vision for worldwide gospel expansion. That Jesus came for everyone. His love is limitless and relentless and it crosses every boundary line. Most of Acts is written to explain how the gospel got to unbelievers. But in today's passage, Paul is speaking to an entirely Christian audience, and we haven't seen that before. It shows us that the Spirit is moving and the church is growing. Well, just a few interesting details to note that are specific to chapter 20. At the beginning of the chapter, Paul heals well, he actually raises back to life a young boy named Eutychus. And the boy had fallen asleep during one of Paul's lengthy sermons, and he fell out of a third-story window. <laughs> Paul raised Eutychus back to life, and then the verses tell us that he went to go have something to eat, and then he came back, and he started preaching until sunrise. I mean, who does that? <laughs> if I calculated it right, I think that the sermon went on for over 12 hours. And that gives you a little bit of insight into how passionate Paul was about preaching Christ. Well, that sermon marathon was also mentioned as the first Sunday service instead of the traditional Sabbath or Saturday service. And you might have also noticed that in this chapter, the tone of the book changes to we and us, because now our author of Acts, Luke, is also traveling with Paul. And Luke ends this chapter giving us a quote from Jesus that isn't found in any of the four gospels, but it's one that we say a lot today. It's verse 35, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that seems to be an overarching theme of this chapter. Well, Paul speaks to the elders of the church, but I think his words are also speaking to all of us because we are all involved 
in ministry at some level. And we might not think of ourselves as having a ministry, but other people just knowing that you study the Bible, they see you as interested in what God has to say. Well, before Paul says his final goodbye, he wants to give at least one last message. And he actually uses his personal lifestyle as the example of how to minister. He's not really boasting like Eric was talking about earlier. Instead, he's explaining that ministry means serving the Lord with humility. And humility is a spiritual attitude of knowing where our place is in relation to God. And I was thinking about it, and that's one of the reasons why Jews wear a yarmulke on their head. And actually, the Pope wears something similar, but his is called a skull cap. And it's to be reminded that God is above all of mankind. That's humility, knowing your place and your dependence on him. Uh, this picture that I have up here, I was trying to find a picture of um, a man wearing a yarmulke, and I took this picture in Jerusalem, but the reason I took the picture <laughs> was because this is a breakfast buffet, and do you notice that is all dessert? <laughs> I mean, in Israel, you have full-blown dessert, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> it's my kind of place. <laughs> well, Paul's mission was teaching both publicly and privately that Jesus saves through repentance and faith. It wasn't just what Paul said that gathered new believers. It was the life he lived that advertised the truth of the gospel. And I can imagine that they also felt the deep love of Christ directly from Paul. He lived a life consistent and authentic with what Jesus taught. And so that shows us that what we believe, it matters. And what we do with what we believe also matters because it is possible to unsay with our actions, what we preach with our mouth. And I read last week that the number one reason why unbelievers don't believe is the hypocrisy of religious people. That's painful to read. But believing isn't always easy for us. That's why we need lots of exposure to the gospel in lots of places over lots of time. Uh, we are slow learners. We need to hear how God is working in real time and in real life from each other. And the message of God's word is the only message that will really change us into being the people that God has planned for us to be. But our personal Bible study is only as powerful as what happens when we close that Bible and we allow those truths or not to impact our life. Joni's God moment was a perfect example of this. Paul knew the gospel was the only hope for the world. He was willing to sacrifice comfort, safety, certainty to share what he knew to be true. Well, Paul warns the elders that following Jesus isn't without trial. He had had threats on his life in Damascus, in Jerusalem. A mob chased him out of Antioch. He was left for dead after being stoned in Lyseria. And he hid from men trying to kill him in Thessalonica. In verses 22 through 24, in the message translations, he, Paul says, There is an urgency before me. I don't know what will happen in Jerusalem. I do know that it won't be a picnic. For the Holy Spirit has let me know repeatedly and clearly that there are hard times and imprisonment ahead. But that matters little. What matters most to me is to finish what God started. 
the job Jesus gave me of letting everyone I I meet know all about this incredibly extravagant generosity of God. Paul knew his life's purpose. He wanted to serve God no matter the pain, no matter the suffering. Well, Paul David Tripp, who writes in New Morning Mercies, and I I brought this book so you all can come up and look at it. It's one of my favorites. He writes about pain and suffering. If we judge God's goodness by the amount of suffering in our life, we will end up concluding that he's not good. If we judge the faithfulness of God by how much disappointment and grief we have had to deal with, we will end up questioning his faithfulness. Scripture doesn't say if we have trials. Scripture says when we have trials. Well, Tripp continues, in the moments when unexpected pain and trials enter our door, These are not indications of the failure of God. They don't say that he has forgotten us or he is unfaithful to his promises. They do not show us that he has favorites. Instead, trials are placed in our lives as tools of his ongoing work of rescuing, transforming, and delivering grace. He is working to produce something much, much better eternal joy. So this week my husband asked me, he said, so what are you teaching on on Thursday? And I said, well, it's Acts 20, but there's, there's a part about pain and suffering. So it's, it's hard. So he sat there for a moment thinking quietly, and I thought maybe he was going to say something uplifting But then he said very sincerely, you know, I don't like pain and suffering. I said, I know, I don't know anybody who does. But Paul David Tripp says, what we think we want is vacation planner Jesus. Just give me a ticket to paradise. (laughs) But he's not vacation planner Jesus, is he? He is our sovereign savior king. This life is meant by God to be a time of preparation for the final destination that will be our home eternal. So right now, life is not paradise. Right now, God in his grace is working to prepare us through the difficulties of life in this fallen world to fulfill what he has promised to each of us. There can be purpose in our pain, but we don't always see it when we are right in the middle of it. Well, as Paul worked and suffered, this segment of his life, it honestly mirrored that of Jesus. He was fully dependent on the Holy Spirit. And I'm putting up here some of the roles and the names of the Holy Spirit. Comforter, counselor, advocate, intercessor, guide. Jesus promised to send the Spirit to counsel and actually pray for those who belong to Christ. So when we are in the middle of uncertainty or shock, You don't know what to pray. You don't know what to do. But one of the most comforting aspects of the Holy Spirit is that he helps us in our weakness. The Spirit himself prays for us and intercedes for us. And you know, we actually don't spend a whole lot of time talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. But the good news is next fall, we are going to do a study on the Holy Spirit. And I think that's going to be so helpful and reassuring for all of us. Well, this lesson today, what does it mean for you and me in how we live out our life? Paul was willing to follow the plan and the purpose that God had for him. So there is a professor at Rice University, Dr. Jim Tour. Uh, he's a professor of material science and nanotechnology. 
He is a literal genius. <laughs> He's also a prolific Bible study teacher. And what's interesting is you usually don't have those two things <laughs> go together. He says that most Christians have neither a plan or an understanding of God's purpose for their life. He says they spiritually aim at nothing and they hit their mark every single time. I've loved listening to Dr. Tour's series on Acts 20, which Graham Newhouse forwarded to a group of us. And in it, he challenges his listeners to ask the question, what purpose does God have for my life? In other words, what is my ministry? Because if we pray those questions, the Holy Spirit will not only answer them, but he will equip us as well. Again, you might not think of yourselves as having a ministry. That might sound like it's reserved for somebody who's been to seminary or maybe for a missionary who's on the other side of the world. But honestly, a ministry is simply how you show others that God is real and that God loves them. Here is one very teeny example. It's so simple of a ministry. I had a meeting last week and it had nothing to do with anything spiritual. I didn't know the host at all, but I walked up to her front door and she had a little pink sticky note on the front door. So I went up to the door to read it. I thought maybe it would say, oh, we're in the backyard, but there was a verse written on it and it was a verse from Psalm 118. So I sat there and I read it and I thought, Oh my goodness, I was not one minute interested in going to this meeting, but after seeing this little post-it note, I thought, wow, this person's going to have something to say. She's going to be so interesting. And you know what? It totally changed my outlook. <laughs> and it was a great meeting. So you might say to yourself, I really don't have a ministry, but you do. And I see you out there. You are creative and selfless, and you are making a difference in how the world sees Jesus. Some of you guide others to know Jesus through his word. Some of you bring jeans so that children can have shoes. You help pastors so that they can get it all done. You provide mental health needs. You make dinners for those who are struggling. You guide new moms. You shepherd students who might not ever graduate from high school, and then you watch them go to college. You are intercessors and peacemakers and note writers. You plant gardens in hospice facilities. You help with technology and video, and you provide music so that God's message can be magnified. God sees you. He sends you out to heal others. And then, in turn, he sends you to help others in your hour of need. So Betsy McKean, <laughs> she has a styrofoam cup ministry, and she spreads pure joy and the word of God with styrofoam cups covered in handwritten scripture. All of these ministries, they point us to Jesus and his gentle care. So I recently read uh, an interview with Jonathan Rumi who plays Jesus in the Chosen TV series. And he said that he often struggles with playing Jesus, but he has come to understand this role as a ministry. And I wanna read directly from his quote. He said, on the set in season one, it was the first time in the series where I started preaching directly from scripture as Jesus. I was standing in the doorway looking onto a crowd of about 50 extras, people who had come to hear the teacher. He said, immediately, this overwhelming anxiety swept over me. He said, I had to tell Dallas Jenkins, the creator of our show, hey, can we stop? For a minute, Jenkins said, well, why? And I told him, because I don't feel worthy to be saying these words right now. Jenkins pulled him aside and said, listen, man, none of us are worthy to be here doing this, but God has chosen you and me 
and everyone else here to tell his story at this time. And that's what I think this lesson, <clears throat> these verses are about today. Our mission, our ministry is to tell God's story at this time. It's what Paul did relentlessly, urgently. Nothing could stop him, no matter what the roadblock, no matter what the pain, no matter what the suffering. It didn't stop him from sharing God's goodness. He kept feeding the flock. So Max Licato did spend time focusing on pain and suffering in this lesson. And when we minister to others, we offer hope, we share his love, and we help ease others' suffering. But there's also a flip side to serving. It helps us. It heals us, especially if we have walked through a similar pain. And ministry is funny like that. It's a win-win. It is better to give than to receive. Well, I want to leave you with this literal picture of hope in the midst of extreme pain. My daughter-in-law, Margaret, sent me this post, and I believe it came from one of the worship leaders at Covenant School in Nashville, the scene of yet another horrific shooting, this time at a Christian school, which happened on March 27th. The post says, we were beginning our first chapel back at Covenant School, and this rainbow came out of nowhere. It was so bright and so intense, and it seemed to last forever. It was like God was yelling from heaven, I see you. I have not forgotten you. And remember, the rainbow is God's sign of a covenant promise. So your step in the spirit today, take a moment to think of someone who ministered God's grace to you in some way recently and thank God for the way that he used them. All right, let's pray. Oh, Lord God, you have not promised that our life or everything in this world would make sense, but you have promised that you will love us and you will never leave us. You are faithful to your promises. I ask, Lord, that you would give us opportunities to share your tender care with others. We pray this in the mighty power of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. All right. Remember, after class prayer with Polly.